basically the reason coaching exists is that in our society, we grow up with this paradigm that you go to school and then you do well, so you go to more school and do a little bit better and keep on going, and then you graduate from somewhere and you're done and your parents are happy because you've been launched and everything else will take care of itself. And coaching is based on the idea that learning doesn't really stop, that there are different points in your life where the need to learn and to figure things out presents itself again. And since there are limited types of formal arrangements or the ones that do exist are extremely costly and time intensive, like a PhD program, for example, or a three month training, coaching tries to step in. And as it's understand now, coaching is what I would call an inquiry based method of awareness, taking action and being accountable. So good coaches ask a lot of questions uh, as opposed to giving advice. Uh, presumably, good coaches have enough professional credibility that we can ask the right questions. And when Google was figuring out who they would bring into their coaching program, they went through a lot of people and wanted to get a certain level of professional credibility. Um, so that, that's what this is all about. And what I do a lot of is career coaching and executive coaching. And that simply means working with people on their careers. And one thing I've learned is that nearly everybody in the world is obsessed with their careers. So when I started coaching a few years ago, I, I had some questions for myself. It was a somewhat of a departure from the other things I'd done. Um, there was a part of me that sought and received a certain amount of validation through institutions and education and so forth. Um, I'd have a number of different careers before. I was in the Foreign Service. I was an attorney. Um, I went to business school, et cetera. Those satisfied those parts of me. But then I went into coaching. And I remember when I started this, wondering, could I really call myself a coach? And so was it enough for me? Would I feel a little bit weird? And one summer, I experimented during the month of July with each day having a different sort of story about myself, all of which were true, but which brought out different details. And so I'd stress different elements of my background that I thought might be important. But ultimately, when I just said, well, I'm a career coach, and basically I work with people on their careers and where they want to go, all of a sudden, everybody was interested. You know, everyone would talk to me in airplanes across the world. It doesn't really matter where you go. Careers are meaningful because careers are how we spend a large part of our lives. And it's how we show up as human beings. And we might not want to define ourselves through careers, but the fact is, is that there's nothing else that we do for so many hours a day um, that accompanies us through the rest of the life. So that's why career coaching can actually be a very rich way of exploration. And the other thing I would say about it is that Generally speaking, there aren't that many clear paradigms about how to run your career. Um, you may have a certain amount of information or opinions by your parents. My guess is that it has very limited value. Um, and you're out in the world and trying to figure things out. So that's where this comes in. And I, I constructed today's topic for uh, some very specific reasons. So the first part is create the career you want. The reasons why I said create the career you want is that careers are fundamentally individual. They are not collective. So everybody knows that people who come to Google have a certain set of attributes, um, achievements in certain realms. And, and you have that in common. But ultimately, your experience is, is unique, and it's individual. So if you take any sort of work setting, uh, when people love their jobs, they tend to love them for somewhat different reasons. And when they hate their jobs, they tend to hate them for different reasons. So creating the career you want is a lot about getting to what motivates you as an individual and figuring out how it's going to work. The other aspect of this is that you're probably better off trying to make it happen yourself or having a vision of how it's going to happen rather than sort of expecting it to land at your feet. That sometimes happens. Some people really luck out. They end up in a job they like. They might have great supervisors. They might have a very clear sense of what they're all about. And other people, it doesn't really happen that way. And it's somewhat randomly distributed. So the more you sort of find a way to take ownership of it, the better off you are. So that's the creative part. And I'm going to introduce, in a few moments, the four basic principles I, I would, would want you to have to manage this process. The second aspect, the non-hyped part. So I don't, even though my comparative advantage as a coach is to have a certain type of knowledge that other people don't have so that companies like Google hire me and maintain my standard of living in a place like New York. E even though that's true, in fact, there aren't really any huge secrets about how careers develop. So nothing in this hour or so is going to dramatically change your life. It might give you a few ideas to work with. 
But career development is really all about the practice. The theory is easy. You can absorb it in, in 10 minutes. But it's a practice that is more complicated, that takes time, and that ultimately reaps the rewards. So the non-hype part is, I will share with you what I have learned over the past couple decades, both in my own career, in working with people from a lot of different industries, ranging from tech to law to hedge funds to banking to journalism to nonprofit and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, it's not going to be, it, it might be somewhat insightful, but don't expect to be a huge secret cache of information because that's not really how it works. And, and the final thing is for thoughtful professionals. So not everybody is really all that thoughtful about their career, including smart people. Not everybody really cares that much about their career. Some people are happy to just do their job and move forward um, or sort of do what other people think is appropriate, such as their parents or co co uh, colleagues. But the real element of being thoughtful is to be open-minded, to have what Buddhists would call a beginner's mind. And the closest, the most important manifestation of that is to consider the possibilities that who you are now may not be everything you're capable of, that the things you think you should like may not actually be the things that you like, and that there may be whole aspects of work or life that you haven't really thought of that actually can be quite exciting. And that's where the thoughtfulness part comes in. It's, it's just being open to alternatives. And when you work at a place like Google, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because it's great and famous and you have a nice cafeteria and you know it's cool and everything. Um, but it also lends people to think that you're in nirvana. And, and you may be in nirvana or you might be a couple levels below it, but ultimately your own satisfaction is gonna come from matching your own interests to your career as opposed to just stepping in something. So that's just sort of the, the warm up. And um, normally when I do workshops, I make them quite interactive. So there are lots of exercises, whether people expect it or not, and lots of interaction. And I'm going to tone that down today, because I don't want to scare anybody. And also, this is my first opportunity to have the millions on YouTube see me. And I don't think they'll like that much just walking, watching a room full of people talking. But I am going to depart for about 90 seconds here uh, to get you thinking about it. And I want each of you to sort of turn to somebody near you, say hi. And, and talk about how you would like to grow in the next year or two. Just how you'd like to grow. All right? So take 90 seconds. And those of you on YouTube, just be patient. We'll get back to the main event. Would anybody care to share anything they talked about, about how they would like to grow? <coughs> how many of you weren't sure of what to say for that? Okay, how many of you had a definite idea? How many of you had a few hypotheses? Okay, so about evenly split. And the reason I ask that question is that that's what it really is about. It's how you want to grow and how you want to allow your career to reflect that. And the more you can articulate hypotheses about it, whether or not you believe that you really want them or they'll come true, the more likely you are to be able to make it happen and take stewardship of your career. So. I, I referred to four basic principles, and I'll tell you what they are, and then I'm going to tell you a bit more about each one of them, and we might do a couple of not so interactive but still helpful exercises to flesh out what I mean. So I would say there are four aspects that are key to really creating the career you want over a long period of time, and none of these actually has a whole lot to do with doing your actual job, but they're the underpinnings of having a meaningful career. And I'll explain each of them in turn. The first one is values. Values is a lot about what do you like and what are you like, and matching that to your job. Second one is vision. Vision is what do I want to create? And oftentimes, we might not be sure of what this is. Third one is relationships. So relationships are all about whom do I want to learn from? Whom do I want to learn from? And the fourth one is experiments. And that is, how do I figure it all out? Because the first three are somewhat inert. By themselves, they're not actually going to tell you what the ultimate equation is for you. But it's experimentation that sort of brings it all together. So I'll talk about each of these in turn, and we'll do a little bit of work with them. So 
values. Values is something coaches talk about a lot. And values in a, in a coaching sense does not mean ethics. It doesn't mean morals. It doesn't have anything to do with what you should do. It's just what you actually like in your life, things that you find appealing. So some examples of values might be creativity, teamwork, autonomy, financial rewards, um, working with others, working alone, working on complex problems, um, writing, editing, what have you. There's really a very long list. And if you happen to get my recently published book, The Creative Lawyer, uh, applicable to almost any professional, you can find some examples. Um, but values are really all the things that essentially make life worth living. So challenge, children, communication, physical fitness, health, uh, winning, success, mastery, international travel, whatever. There's a huge number of values. And virtually any coach would say that if you are happy in your life and work, if you feel relatively fulfilled, awake, alive, it's probably because you're living a life and have a job where you're able to manifest those values. So if creativity is important to you, you're able to be creative. If having time alone is important to you, you are not in the middle of a trading floor with everybody messing with you all day long. Um, and by contrast, if you spend a lot of time feeling frustrated, angry, trapped, boxed in, you're probably not living in sync with your values. There's something about who you are as an individual that can't be expressed. So a lot of coaching really focuses on how do you create the conditions where you can be more yourself in whatever you choose to do. And it may be creating that mix within the job. That's what I would do with my clients in executive coaching type things. It may be finding opportunities outside your job to manifest these. And it may also be sometimes changing jobs or careers towards something that is much more appealing to you. The thing about values to keep in mind is that they really do differ by individuals. And different individuals feel different values in the same thing. So let's take a place like Google. Let's say you're an engineer and you're on a project team. And, and you love your life and job. My, my hunch is that people will actually love different aspects about it. So some people might like the creativity of devising new solutions and mastering the information universe for the next 50 years. Um, other people might like working in a really nice office that's conveniently located to their Tribeca apartment, um, just a few subway hops, and has a nice salary. You know, nothing wrong with it. Other people might like the excitement of being part of something new. Um, others might have a boss that they really like. Others might like the solitude of not being bugged by a boss. So there are really different aspects of it for different people. Um, similarly, you can express values in different aspects of your life. So let's say, that, let's say that part of you really wants to make a significant contribution to the world as a whole. There are different ways that, that different individuals might do this. So one person might view making a contribution as participating in the development of new products at Google because it's having a large effect on the rest of the world. Other people might choose to do something within Google, creating an employee collection for Darfur or some similar cause. Others might do something completely outside of Google to show that they want to make a contribution. So they might become involved in, let's say, one of the campaigns of a political candidate. These are all the same value, but individuals will have different ways of expressing them. So in a nutshell, a lot of what coaching does is try to connect, first identify what your values are, and then find specific ways of manifesting them. And again, we don't want to be too reductive. So it's easy to fall into the temptation of thinking that it all has to happen in the job. Sometimes it happens in the way that you do your job, and sometimes it occurs outside of the job in your own life. So then the question comes up, well, how do I actually know what my values are? And as I said before, these are almost the, the underpinnings of, of what you do. And it's really not that hard. There are a lot of different exercises you can do. You can kind of get any sort of coaching book, and it will lead some through. But it's really sort of asking yourself questions of what is it I like about the things that I like? When I'm really the most me, what types of things that I'm doing? Um, to put it another way, when do I really like being me? So I have, I have a little quiz that can, can help you discover some of these. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about 10 questions. And you can either write these down or answer them mentally. 
don't so much worry about the questions, it's more the answers that are significant, all right? So question one, what parts of the newspaper do you read first? Or for the younger kids, what bookmarks do you have on your computer? Trying to keep in touch. Number two, what are three books you've read in the last year? Three books you've read in the last year. Number three, as a child, what did you do in your free time? As a child, what did you do in your free time? Number four, what's a life you haven't lived? So you're here, but what else could you have been or still want to be? Number five, what types of activities energize you? What gets you excited? Number six, what do you like to be in charge of? So it could be a project, an activity, something outside of work. And one of my favorite questions, what famous people intrigue you and why? So if you look at the answers to questions like this, you typically get a sense of what is really significant to you. And when you look at your own job and think about the things that really are enjoyable to you, you can extract more information about what your core values are. And the more you understand what your core values are, the more you can create the conditions for satisfaction. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that and move on to the next category, so vision. So vision is something everybody talks about, um, but in sort of weird ways. So I personally think that Americans are very ambivalent about vision. Um, it's considered okay if you uh, want to do something very businessy or athletic or very specific. And it's also okay when you're a child. People are always asking you what you want to be when you grow up. But then when you grow up, you're assumed to have sort of solved the problem. And people are no longer so interested in what you might want to be and sometimes are somewhat threatened by the, the process. But vision is still really powerful because when you create a vision of something that you really want, of something that you want to create, it helps to motivate you. So it's one thing to come into work every day, plot ahead, um, keep working, and move ahead gradually. It's another to have some sense of where you want to be at two years, or five years, or 10 years down the line. And these may be professional endeavors. It could be starting a company. It could be getting rich. It could be seeing the world. Um, it could also be things like having a child or making some contribution to community. Whatever turns you on. Um, vision is a little bit like a muscle. So the more you exercise it, the more likely you are to achieve these things. And in some ways, it doesn't actually matter if you achieve the particular vision that you create um, so much as giving you an opportunity to focus your energy, get other people involved in what your interests are, and kind of keep moving forward. So we won't go into a lot of detail here, but typically, one way that we could explore creating vision is coming up with vision statements. So a vision statement is basically a couple sentences or a paragraph that describes you, a sort of alternative future version of you that may be either highly related to where you are now or, or even quite, quite different. Um, and sort of elaborating on that. And I will typically have clients write these in the present tense, um, but set five or 10 years in the future. And the idea isn't so much to focus on what's realistic, so much as to focus on what's exciting. So the first step, I would say, for anybody, is you just come up with sort of a short list of things that are intriguing to you, whether or not they make sense. So a couple of examples are, where might you want to be in five or 10 years? VP of engineering at a startup, Pilates teacher, elected official, Entrepreneur living in Shanghai, could be anything. Don't worry so much about how realistic they are. And the next step is you create a longer vision statement. So I'll give you two alternative examples here. Um, and, and you'll notice as I, as I say these that there's a lot of detail, 
They may not be hugely realistic, but they talk about what you're doing, what it feels like, the types of experiences you have. So the first one is a sort of googly one of my own invention. Um, set in the future, you don't have a, a set. Do you guys have a location in Austin, Texas? Oh, you do? Oh, OK. Um, OK, well, so I'm a manager of engineering. This is the future. I'm a manager of engineering at Google. I recently moved back to Austin, Texas, my hometown, to help build up our massive new, newer facility. Over the last several years, I've managed to develop both my technical abilities as well as my managerial skills. I'm pretty good at management. People love working on my team, and I mentor several younger engineers who are interested in developing more people skills. On the weekends, I spend time at my eco cabin on Lake Travis, where I have developed my own brand of heirloom tomatoes. So there's a work aspect. There's a personal aspect. And it's fun. And it's forward looking. And you'll also notice that within it is a sense of your competency development. So your competencies are really your skills, your knowledge, certain traits. And this is actually part of vision and professional development, is sort of having a sense of where you are now, but also where you want to be. So you could be an individual contributor now with little management experience. And you might get a hankering for what management might be like. And so you're projecting it into the future. Um, I'll give you a second example. This is sort of equally possible, albeit not seemingly directly related to what anybody here is doing. Um, I'm a social entrepreneur. I run an innovative, cool organization that helps poor people in developing countries move ahead in their lives. Although the work is based overseas, mostly in southern Africa, I still live in the US. My job is to do strategy, fundraising, and operations. I use my Google management training to keep the organization efficient and compliant with regulations. I frequently visit our projects overseas. The work involves lots of kids and teenagers, so there's lots of positive energy, which I love. So again, it's very much a combination of the professional direction, but also what's personally motivating. And the thing about vision is that, um, first of all, it's actually easier to come up with several vision statements than just one. When you just get to one, people start getting a little weird about it and thinking of reasons why it can't really come through. And is this what I really want? And I'm not actually sure. When you come up with a four or five, it stimulates your creativity a lot more. And the second thing is that once you actually start daring to talk about it with other people, you find that you get useful feedback. Uh, not everybody will be, will be totally supportive, but typically you get a lot of ideas. So if you use the relocating to Austin Lake Travis eco cabin one, um, you may end up getting transferred. It could also be that somebody says, oh, you know, there's another company that's just starting up in Austin that's looking for a VP of engineering, and you should talk to my friend who's doing it. Or, uh, I happen to have an eco cabin in Vermont, and I'm going to the uh, annual corn festival, and come along with me. So there are a lot of different ways that the, the kernels of, of passion within your vision statement might end up being developed in, in other areas. So that's part two, which is vision. Part three is relationships. And oh, there I am. And I, um, I specifically use the word relationships because the word networking um, needs a serious rebranding. Uh, people are not so crazy about that word, um, and, and for valid reasons. So we're going to talk about relationships. So relationships are a key part of work and moving ahead and life satisfaction. And it sort of seems obvious, but it's not always so obvious, particularly uh, when you're in kind of a brainy profession and when you're largely motivate when you're rewarded for your thinking abilities and your abilities to be almost an, a technocrat as opposed to um, managing or working on teams. And this is one thing that I actually think that engineers and management consultants and lawyers and bankers all tend to have in common, along with academics, is that people with these backgrounds have grown up being rewarded for using their brains and getting the right answer and being smart and accomplishing specific tasks. And so they tend to rest a lot of their sense of self and their capabilities in those abilities and then underestimate the value that other people have in launching their careers and, and having an effect. In fact, people are deeply connected to everything that, that we do. And a good way of, of thinking about it is just reflect for a moment on one or two people who had a critical effect in your being here. 
those sort of but for people who you would not be here but for them. Um, and I can think of two for myself. Um, number one, the reason I'm here is that I had a client who now works at Google who passed my name on to somebody else who then decided to look at my background and interview me. So if I didn't know that person, um, I wouldn't be here. And by the same token, it's possible that if he didn't know me, he wouldn't be here either. So there was a mutually positive relationship there. Uh, a second example is Mr. DeNike. Hi, Mr. DeNike. You're watching me. Mr. DeNike was my high school speech and debate coach at uh, Valencia High School in Placentia, California. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons I can speak here and not be totally freaked out and have some level of basic comfort and enjoyment is that when I was in high school, I did a probably five or 600 practice speeches as part of being in this competitive world. And Mr. DeNike, my teacher, would sort of listen to every one of those speeches as well as drive me and my debate partner up and down California and to Nevada and Utah to these distant tournaments in his um, Buick. So those relationships have built my career to a certain degree, and so have a thousand others. And the same is true of, of a lot of what you guys do. Um, behind every individual success, there are other people. Relationships, of course, have another huge effect in that information and opportunities trans tend to be transfer, uh, transferred through personal networks. So there, there's a sort of weird saying that's a little bit true, but not entirely true, and that's it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, that's overstated. Uh, rarely will that actually help you unless you're in an extremely nepotistic culture. But the element of truth is that it's hard to evaluate people if you haven't been given an opportunity to first be seen as an individual. And further, that even though we imagine that we live in a sort of meritocratic world where information travels seamlessly by computer, in fact, lots of decisions are made very subjectively. And so opportunities tend to come through my friend as opposed to some general uh, email casting call. And one thing to remember about this is that the types of people who are really needed for your career development and, and sort of life development, it's not the most obvious thing in the world. Um, there, there's a lot of research about how networks of people affect people's success and happiness on the job. And there's a distinction that can be made between what are called strong ties and weak ties. And this has been researched over the past few decades. So strong ties are people you know quite well. So they're family, friends, roommates, close coworkers. Basically where there's easy exchange. You could call or email them, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Weak ties are everybody else that you know. So they could be people that you don't really know that well. Um, I mean, after today, I'm conceivably a weak tie, since you've seen me, but may not know me. Um, as well as people that you used to know but have fallen out of touch with, um, or didn't know that well to the, uh, at the very beginning. So people you interviewed before, former coworkers, people you went to school with, your parents, friends, and so forth. And there's actually a lot of research about um, which is more valuable. And in fact, weak ties are more valuable than strong ties as far as long-term career development and also happiness. And when people are looking for jobs, typically people who rely on their weak ties actually have more offers, higher salary, and have greater job satisfaction than people who rely on their strong ties. Um, just curious, how could this be true? What's the reason for this? Yes, over here. Correct. Uh, it's there are more, but it, it, they are different. And they have different information than you do. Strong ties often have the same information that you do, so there's less diversity in the set. You had a thought over here? This OK. There yes. Excellent point. So strong ties are too emotionally connected. The way I would put it is strong ties may have a vested interest in who you are. So strong ties can actually constrain you in certain circumstances um, because they have an idea of who, who you are. And they may express loving doubts about interests you have or, or relationships you have um, because they have a different idea of who you are. And I'm sort of a good example. So I, my, my mother is a college professor. She teaches accounting. And 
she just sort of looked on and oh, I wonder if she sees this. Um, I don't think she's that technically competent, so I'm free to say this. Uh, she just sort of looked on in mounting horror for about the last 15 years at the career choices I've made. Because I did a JD MBA at Stanford, which she thought was great. I then went work for this firm called Davis Polk and Wardwell, which is very well known among law firms. And then I sort of leapt. And I hung out for a bit. I did a startup, which had a horrible, bloody death. And then I went to coaching about six years ago, which is actually what I've done the longest and which has been the most satisfying. My mother, for a long time, did not quite get what I was doing or chose not to get it. So well into my career as a coach, when I had clients and people liked me and you know, I felt it was really adding something, I would periodically get these phone messages from her. They would say something like, hello, Michael, this is your mother. Um, I'm calling to tell you that I was on a flight yesterday, and I went through O'Hare Airport, and I talked to this man who was really nice, and he works for some big company. And I don't think he's a lawyer, but I'm sure they have a legal department. And even though it's not New York, Chicago's a good city. So I got his card, and I think you should call him. And I was like, I kind of have this business already. And that sort of thing continued for a while. And, and by contrast, around the same time, I went to this coach training in Santa Barbara, California, which along with San Francisco is like the epicenter of all the coaches in the world. And this particular one was called the Hudson Institute, and I really liked it. And the, the primary um, demographic were people in their mid to late 40s and 50s who had already had another career before and kind of wanted to do a second career. And as soon as I got there, it was like a love fest. People came running up to me and embracing me. And whenever I'd say something in the group, they'd be like, mm, you know, good comment. And sort of hugging me and like, Michael Melcher, this is your path. I see it. You know, the other stuff, that's good. But this is what you're meant to be. And I, I just can't wait to see what happens. And, and that was what I really needed at that point in my life. I needed somebody who could see that part in me. Um, and these people who I didn't really know managed to connect with the kind of energy that was important to me and a vision I had in ways that people that were close to me couldn't necessarily do that. And I will tell you that the more successful you are, the more critical it is to meet people that are outside of your normal realm and who understand you either as who you are apart from your career or understand elements of you that other people may not see. Um, so enough said on, on that. Uh, this. All right, so we're going to move to the final thing, final idea, which is experimentation. So we talked about values, vision. Those are how you get a sense of what's right for you, what might be right, um, either in terms of how you like to live or what you want to create ultimately. Relationships are another way both of making it happen as well as getting really valuable information about the world. Final is experimentation. And experimentation is how you figure it out. And a lot of what I found in over the last number of years, um, let me backtrack a second. So I wrote this book. Um, I had it, the idea for a long time. And I'd been reading self-help and career stuff basically in my whole life since high school. It was just sort of my thing. And, and I've read a lot of this stuff. And one shortcoming that a lot of these books have is that they kind of give you the elements, but then they stop. It's not really clear what happens then. And they sort of have this idea that if you just believe in yourself enough and have a strong enough vision, that's enough. And I actually don't think that's really true. And if somebody were to say, Michael Melcher, do you believe that fundamentally the most important thing is to believe in yourself? I would say, no, I don't think that's actually the most important thing. It's, it's nice. It's, a, it's an important thing to have. But by itself, it's not really going to do the job. Because life is just too complex. And that's where experiments come in. So, an experiment is simply anything that allows you to test a different reality. It's like putting on an outfit before you buy it. It's a way to inhabit a role. And either within your work life or outside of it, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can experiment. So anything you do in your 20% time, see how into your culture I am, that may qualify as an experiment. Um, working with a completely different manager or somebody from a different background, either demographically or in terms of education or upbringing, that's an experiment. Taking on a project that's way outside of your normal comfort zone is a good experiment. Reading a book can be an experiment. Going to a speech, going to a conference, taking a trip. 
These are all different types of, of experiments. And the value is they give you different data. Once you have the data, you can see how it feels, how you show up doing those activities, and, and what sort of response you get from the outside world. Uh, volunteering can be an experiment, writing an article, doing a business plan. It's, what it really is is it's more than just thinking. And one error that brainy people with good educations make is that they think too much. Thinking is drastically overrated when it comes to careers. I'm just going to tell you, it won't, it won't really help you. It'll give you a little bit of insight, but it will also keep you paralyzed, and it will detach you from the process. Movement in your life and career is really all about action, small, specific, discrete actions. So in general, you should, I would recommend you take the baby step as opposed to waiting for the big win or the big goal. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive because we've actually grown up thinking of success as something that happens when you get a clear sense of what your goals are and then go for them. Because it kind of worked for a good chunk of your life, but it doesn't keep on working as you get into the messier reality of what jobs are really like and, and what you are really like as a grown up and what you are like now. So I have um, a, little, a little thought exercise for you on, on creating experiments. Okay, I'm gonna give you two scenarios and you're gonna think of some good ones. So although Jose, is an engineer at Google and writes great code, he thinks his writing talent does not suck. Actually, he loves writing, is quite good at it, and wonders if that is something he should do with his life. So what experiments could Jose do to test this? Yes. Excellent idea. Write on the Google blog. Right. Low investment in time, but maybe get some real data that way. What else could you do? Yeah. Write a uh, article from a low circulation magazine that's interesting. Correct. Uh, right, because he's exploring. What does writing mean? Does it mean writing a novel? Who knows? It's a way of checking it out. Yes. Take a course. Courses are great. There are many courses in New York filled with bankers and lawyers and perhaps Google employees. Um, what else? What's something um, outside of New York? What's something a little crazy or different? Or you could go to a conference. You could try to go to a writer's colony. He could, he could apply for a film school without necessarily going, but just going through the process can give you a lot of data. What about something that seems very mundane but might actually help him? You write a journal, mm -hmm. kind of get to know his voice. How about something mundane related to work that might give him data? It's too close to home. I, I would imagine, yes. To be a technical writer. Um, and there might be technical writing applications within what he's doing. So when I was in business school, um, there were a lot of very quant people, and I was okay, but by comparison with them, a little less confident. So I'd always, I would always volunteer to do the write-up on any of our projects, which is kind of a wimpy way of going through business school. And, and a good experiment would have been like, I'll do the stochastic modeling, or whatever I once knew that meant. But, it's really stretching beyond your comfort zone and finding little ways to test things. Because people hold themselves back because they get wrapped up in making a huge jump when there might actually be something that would help them test. Okay, I'll give you another example, uh, another test. Jill is an engineer and is an individual contributor at Google. She is interested in management but is not sure how much she would like it. Plus, there is no obvious immediate promotion available to a management position. So what are some experiments Jill can do to test this interest? Yes. Oh, I like that. Are they available for who? Are, really? That's, can I get one? It'll be like Mr. Kramer's intern. Um, OK, what's another experiment? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. You could teach a class. and. It's deadly here, let me tell you. No. Um, yeah, take class. What else? Uh, 
Right. So those are ways that, that she can get a sort of feeling of what management might mean to her without it being really high stakes in terms of a huge time sink, but it would still be valuable information. Yeah. Right, and there at, there's actually um, there are a number of nonprofits that now specifically exist in New York and San Francisco to try to draw in professional talent, and so just seeing what that is like. Um, so those are all examples of, of experiments, and what I would leave with you on that point is that people kind of get this idea. What they typically do, though, is they give up too early. So they'll get one or two data points, and at that point, the task is to really refine it. So let's say you take a writing course, and it's kind of lame, and you're really tired whenever you go, and you don't really have any ideas for memoirs, which is the subject of it. Now, you have the choice of deciding that I don't want to be a writer at all, or perhaps what you've really decided is I don't like this particular style, and there might be other methods of doing it. So the more you try to get uh, meaningful information while keeping your investment minimal is how you get a lot of data. And this is actually what keeps you fresh going forward. So those are basically the four planks that I wanted to share with you. And I'll just close with a little quote from an excellent book that I would recommend to all of you if you are interested in this subject. Uh, the book is called Working Identity. And it's about what career development and career change really look like over time, primarily for professional people. It's aimed a bit more at people, I would say, early 30s to late 40s, early 50s. Um, but it's an excellent book, and it's by a woman named Erminia Ibarra, I-B-A-R-R-A. -R -R um, and she has a quote, we learn who we are in practice, not theory, by testing reality, not by looking inside. We discover the true possibilities by doing, trying out new activities, reaching out to new groups, finding new role models, and reworking our story as we tell it to those around us. So with that in mind, um, I'm available for questions. And in the meantime, I thank you for making this experiment of coming and seeing my inaugural tech talk. Um, thank you.